Hey, what's up, Journey family? We are so grateful for the opportunity to meet online and to worship together. Thank you for inviting us into your home or wherever you may be. And don't forget to click the share button to invite even more of your family and friends to join in. Also be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected to your Journey family. Okay, we're about to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Hallelujah Heaven 
What a blessing it is to be here with you all. So honored to worship with you. You guys are awake. I can yeah. tell that right now. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome all those online. In fact, can we just welcome them all together, church? Yes. Yes, yes. From wherever you're tuning in, so glad that you are with us this morning. And I want to welcome all those that are new, both online and in, in the room. Uh, if you're new to Journey, so glad that you are with us. Welcome. I want you to know that especially. And uh, we have a, a link on the screen that you can follow. And uh, we would love for you to connect in that way if you want to get connected in that way. And uh, so just jump on that and you'll see it'll be pretty self-explanatory once you jump on there. You can take a picture of it and do it later, however you wanna do that. But right now, we're gonna continue in worship, and you know, I, we've, been, we've been in this Love Is series, and I think it's perfect. It's perfect any time, but especially in this time that we're in right now, just, uh, just to focus on who God is and his greatest character, and God is love, and so we're gonna be walking through that um, as Pastor John brings the message. And last week, we talked about love being kind. We talked about a few things, but one thing we talked about was love being kind. And right now, you probably know somebody, it seems like, uh, you know, different numbers of, of sicknesses are rising with COVID and all this. You probably know somebody personally, uh, if you're like me. And um, we just want to lift up those that are, that are struggling right now, whether, you, whether it's somebody in your family, friends, or just somebody you know about. And I think the kindest thing we can do as believers in prayer and believers in what God, uh, how he's created us to have a relationship and a communication with him through prayer, that's pretty awesome and it's pretty powerful. And it's not something we want to underestimate. And so that, that being said, and that the, I think most of us that believe in that, in this room can, uh, and online, can come together and just acknowledge that maybe the kindest thing we can do right now is to just lift up a prayer for those people that we know. And so I, wanna, I want you to do that in your own words. I'm going to give you a moment to do that, and then I'll, I'll close this out in prayer, and we'll continue in worship right now. So let's pray together. So God, right now, God, we thank you. We thank you for being the one and only God, the true and living God, the creator of all good things. God, we thank you for, for creating us in your image, creating us uh, just with an open invitation to have a relationship, a communication with you, God, through prayer, and it's just amazing. And so God, uh, right now, we just lift up all those that are struggling in this time. And God, we know that there, there are many and uh, God, maybe in this room, uh, we're just struggling with certain thoughts around uh, just our nation and different things happening right now. And so God, may we just acknowledge that the kindest thing we can do in this moment, God, is lift up uh, a word of prayer on someone's behalf. And so God, I pray right now that we do that. And God, that we constantly do that, not even just in this moment, God, but just a continual, constant prayer, a continual, constant, open communication with you, God. God, you are so good. We thank you for this time, though, that we can come together and worship. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here right now in this moment, God, and we welcome you. God, we continue in worship right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. From the darkness, I called your name. Into the darkness, your mercy came. You called me out and lifted me up. How great is your love. You bore my weakness. You took my shame. Buried my burdens in fields of you called me out and lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. In a set affection, gave your life for us. We are How great, how great, how great. 
never there There will never be A God like you A love so true There has never been You are so kind, so patient, so good. God, we just come before you right now, God. Just continually worship, God. Thank you. Thank you so much for this time that we can sing and worship. And God, I pray right now that you just fill us. You continually fill us over these moments that we're together right now. God, you open our hearts and open our minds to what you have to say to us over these next few moments. God, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Y'all can grab a seat. Hello, Journey family and friends. Food for Life is a monthly mission here at Journey where we serve families in our local community by providing food to those who are in need. Last year, due to your generosity, Journey was able to distribute 2,785 bags of food to 1,217 families. That's amazing. So thank you for being a blessing to families who need a little help in tough times. Let me tell you about Jose a young man who had recently been released from prison and was in need of food. He heard about Food for Life and he came looking for help. He came back a few more times and eventually he began serving. He made it known that he wanted to be one of the volunteers who put food into the trunk of the cars. When asked why that particular role, he said, because I know how it made me feel when someone put food in the trunk of my car. I knew I was gonna have enough food to eat that week and I wanna help others have that same feeling. You know, Jesus once said, whatever you did for one of these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you've done for me. You can support Food for Life and many other Journey Ministries through regular giving, either online through our website, through the Journey app. You can send your gift in the mail to our office, or if attending in person, you can give at one of the many giving stations. Also, next week, We hope that you'll consider grabbing one of the blue Food for Life shopping bags. Simply fill it up with some or all of the items printed right on the side of the bag. And then on Sunday, January 31st, bring it back and drop it off at the Food for Life tent as you enter the atrium. 
pray with me. Father, we are so grateful for your love and your grace and the blessings that come only from you. We just pray now that you would bless the gifts that are given. May they honor you. May they expand your kingdom. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Love is what God is. And how he made us was with love. And yeah. What I think love is, um, is like people caring for you. They take care of you. I also think love means family. I think thankful things. Love is being kind to one another and treating people like you want to be treated. Love is something in the air that you love someone. That's it. Hello, Journey. I want to say welcome to those in Apopka, to those that are in Lake County. We want to welcome those at our Lake County location and to those that are joining us online from all around the world. In the opening weeks of 2021, we have been in this series called Love Is because what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Some of you, that just goes right over the head of... uh, No, not just for one, but for everyone, right? (laughs) Here's what we've looked at over the past few weeks. We've said, number number one, love is greater than everything, and it really is. Number two, if you want to win, or excuse me, if you win at love, you will not fail at life. If you fail at love, you cannot win at life. And last week, uh, we emphasized this again. Everything minus love equals nothing. Everything minus love equals nothing. Last week, we looked at how love is patient and how hurry is the great enemy of love in our day because you can't love people in a hurry. You just can't love people in a hurry. So all week long, we've been working on ruthlessly eliminating hurry from our lives, right? Living in relaxed, unrushed, unfrenzied, Patient love. So how's that going for you right now? Uh, you need some more time to work on that? Too bad. We got to hurry. Got to get through this. So keep up. We're studying the teachings from uh, the most revered, cherished, and oft quoted influential description of love in the history of humanity. It's taken from Paul's first recorded letter to the church in the ancient city of Corinth, chapter 13. A lot of people think of those words only as beautiful poetry to be read at weddings. Uh, They think of those words as being soft and like something you might find on a Hallmark card or in a Hallmark movie and that the church at Corinth probably got warm and fuzzy feelings as they heard these words being read to them. But as the wise old sage of college football analyst And fellow Orlando resident, Lee Corso, likes to say, not so fast, my friend. The reality is that by the time Paul got to the words of this beautiful chapter, the people at Corinth would have responded just the opposite. These words written by Paul were actually a deliberate and provocative rebuke to the local church there. And when we understand them correctly... They will be a challenge to us as well. Now, what prompted Paul to write to the church at Corinth in the first place, and this is uh, quite common in the letters in the New Testament, is that there were some really serious problems going on within the church. I know, I know, it's hard for us to imagine in our emotionally healthy, spiritually mature community of believers here at Journey Christian Church, where everybody agrees and gets along, and seldom has heard a discouraging word. I know it's hard for us to believe that, that there are churches, I've been told though, that there are churches out there who encounter problems. And some of them are quite messy. People at Corinth were messed up. They were indulging in attitudes and behaviors that were harmful and counterproductive in the way they would treat other people. There was a good bit of social climbing and chasing after status and money. And that wrecked any sense of biblical community. And there were three problems in particular that Paul kind of hammers them for. 
He he writes, for example, in, in chapter three, he says to them, you're still worldly. That was not intended as a compliment, you understand. To be worldly means to be opposed to God and his kingdom and his way. He says this, for since there's envy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? He has a lot to say about how envy led them into rivalry and factions and ego and then into a second related problem that he talks about numerous times. He writes, so then no more boasting about human leaders. Or he asks a question, why do you boast? Or he makes this statement, your boasting is not good. You know, the word boast is used 37 times in the entirety of the New Testament, but Corinth seems to be like ground zero for boasting in the ancient world. To the extent that Paul uses the word for boasting in his letters to the Corinthian Christians more than it's used in the rest of the New Testament combined. So there's a huge amount of envy. There's a great amount of boasting. And all this reflects a third problem, a deep internal problem that Paul describes by using an even rarer word. In fact, this word is used only when Paul writes to Corinth in all the New Testament. But he uses it in this letter repeatedly. He talks about how when they become spiritually mature, then they will not be puffed up. But because they're not mature, some of them have become puffed up. To make it really clear, he writes this, and you are puffed up. (laughs) And then he says this, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Puffed up is a really colorful term in the Greek language in which Paul writes It's like inflating a balloon that wants to look really big and impressive on the outside, but inside, it's just a bunch of hot air waiting to be popped. That's kind of like puffed up. So here's how to break it down. Envy is something you do. Boasting is something you do. Puffed up is something you are. And Paul hits them hard with these three problems. These words over and over and over in this letter. You envy, you boast, you're puffed up. You envy, you boast, you're puffed up. And now we come to this beautiful, inspiring, feel-good passage that we call the love chapter, chapter 13. Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of all prophecy, and can move mountains and fathom all mysteries and knowledge, but have not love. Though though I give away all my possessions and my body to be given to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. And to everybody at Corinth, these are just, they're beautiful words. They're basking in them. But then he puts the hammer down, and he shifts to talking about what love is not. Notice what he says. Love does not envy Love does not boast. Love is not puffed up. In other words, what is love not like, Corinth? Well, it's not like you. In fact, it's the opposite of you. Ouch. On the old TV sitcom Seinfeld, there was a character named George Costanza who's like this lovable loser that nothing ever works out for until one day he says, my life is like nothing what I wanted. My every decision is wrong. My every instinct is wrong. It's just all wrong. And so he lands on a new life strategy called do the opposite. Just whatever he would normally be inclined to do, he decided he would do the opposite. And it works out great for him. Beautiful women are attracted to him now. Finance and success begin to flow towards him just from doing the opposite. And Paul's basically saying to the Corinth church in this chapter, you're like the George Costanza of churches. You're like the opposite of what love is supposed to be. And in case anybody missed it, the next two items he chews Corinth out for are that they are self-seeking, egocentric, and they dishonor one another because of all the ladder climbing. Look at what he writes. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. In other words, deliberately, not once, not twice, but five times, Paul says, not so subtly, to the Corinthian Christians, and love is not like you, and not you, and not you, and not you, and not you. And of course, Paul is saying all this in love, right? (laughs) 
He's saying this not in spite of, but because of the fact that he really does love the people of Corinth. He loves them too much to let them wallow in the deception and distortion of an unloving life. You see, here's what we need to understand. Love is not primarily about making people feel good. He doesn't want them to miss out on what matters most, which is growing toward the people God intended them to be and building a community that is the opposite of the way our world works apart from God. And that's gonna demand a strategy of do the opposite. So for the rest of our time together today, I wanna focus on this first great love is not statement that Paul makes. He says, love does not envy. And here's why. Envy in many ways is not just sin. It's really the opposite of love. A person of love feels enhanced by the well-being of others. A person of envy feels diminished by the well-being of others. When I love somebody, I constantly want to build them up. When I envy somebody, I compare myself to them, and I actually want them to be torn down. I want to outdo them. There's an old story told about two hikers in the woods, and they see a bear from a distance approaching their camping area. And one hiker quickly pulls out a pair of tennis shoes out of his backpack, hurriedly begins to put them on. The other hiker says to him, you're crazy if you think you can outrun that bear. To which the first hiker said, I don't have to outrun that bear. I just got to outrun you. You see, envy wants to outrun, outsmart, outearn, outachieve anyone and everyone it perceives to be a rival. No one can get rid of envy by trying really, really hard not to envy. That is never the way spiritual transformation works. Envy can only be gotten rid of as it's replaced with a power of love. When love is present, there's just not room for envy to grow. And the place to begin in addressing this is with ruthless honesty. So let me just ask right up front, how many people here really wrestle with envy? That's what I thought, hardly anybody at all, just a few hands. It, and isn't it great, one of the things great about living in the 21st century is that thank God, with the help of technology and education and scientific breakthroughs, we've basically defeated the problem of envy. People never compare themselves with other people. There's no concern about appearance or image or uh, image management or being smarter. People just live with modest spirits and contented, quiet hearts. Isn't, isn't that wonderful? But that's not my story. I have a long history of envy. People who do a lot of study on this tell us that we usually don't envy distant, famous people who are part of another world. No, no. We envy people in our own world, in our own networks, people we're close enough to that it pains us when we see them doing better than us. And that's been true with me. Now, since none of you struggle with envy, or not many of you, just so you can see what someone who struggles with envy looks like, I'm gonna give you a list of the people I have envied. Not names of people, so calm down. <laughs> but categories of people. For example, people who are more athletic than me, particularly those who can dunk a basketball. Or for that matter, who can touch the rim, and now at my age, people who can touch the bottom of the net. People who are smarter than me, which would be a lot of people, guys that are better looking than me, which covers a lot of ground, people in great physical shape, especially guys that have thick chest and bulging biceps and look great in those Smedium t-shirts. <laughs> Musi musicians who can write lyrics that are so simple and yet so profound and who then write the most beautiful music to go along with their inspiring lyrics, people that are mechanically inclined that can fix or build things pastors that can preach without notes and who do it so artfully and skillfully, people who tell funnier stories than I do, people who are better pastors and better speakers and better writers and better leaders than me, parents of perfect families with perfect children and perfect pets who go on perfect vacations and just move from success to success, people who are great at confrontation, who, who never get defensive or stumble over their words in the heat of the moment 
or use the silent treatment when they're mad, but they just get more articulate the more tense things get. In summary, people who have it all together. And if you're here today or watching online or in Lake County, and if you don't have a problem with envy, I envy you too. (laughs) I envy, but then because I'm puffed up inside, I deny my envy. I pretend like I do not envy. I pretend like I'm above envy. And I boast. But I'm careful to disguise it because I'm a pastor. I try to do it in clever, spiritual-sounding ways that make it look like I'm humble. But inside, I'm not. Some of you right now are thinking, wow, pastor, you're really messed up. (laughs) And you're more right than you know, let me tell you. That's why one guy told me some time ago, Pastor John, we've had other pastors tell us they're just as messed up as we are, but you're the first one we believed. (laughs) I would have made a good Corinthian. (laughs) Really. Because Paul said to Corinthians like me, love does not envy. Envy is the opposite of love in a way that even most other sins are not. Greed is a sin. I might be greedy. I might want just as much money as you have, but if I envy you, I don't just want me to have more. I want you to have less. I want you to be diminished. I want something bad to be true of you. Samuel Roberts was a 19th century British poet And he was in a social gathering of people who were all praising a duke that they knew because he had good looks and he had talent and he had wealth and he had a promising future. And in a brief pause, Robert said, thank God he has bad teeth. (laughs) See, that's envy. If you have everything else going for you, I hope you at least have bad teeth or a bad something. Envy is such a sneaky thing. In some ways, envy is incredibly contemporary in our day. There's a researcher by the name of Alexandria Samuel who's documented the impact of social media use on envy. And because now we have more access to more successes by more people, people like us than ever before in history, and they all seem to be daily, digitally recording these wonderful lives. And it seems like everybody has better jobs and better behaved kids and better ideas for decorating and better quarantine projects and better DoorDash dining experiences and better diets than us. The more time people spend on social media, the more envy they experience. That's a fact. Envy is such a miserable thing. But we do it to ourselves. And at the same time, envy is so old and so subtle And it's so central to the human experience that the first time the word sin is mentioned in the Bible, it's a story about envy. You see, envy goes way, way back and cunningly deep. It's the opposite of love. You've probably uh, heard of the story of Cain and Abel, right? World's first brothers, sons of Adam and Eve. God created family. God created brotherhood for the purpose of love, but Cain did not love his little brother. We're told in a very compact, succinct passage that they both bring an offering to God. Abel apparently brings the best that he has, the choice portions, the firstborn of his flocks and herds. Cain, on the other hand, brings a less than his best offering. He's apparently just going through the motions and giving to God. So Abel knew a spiritual intimacy with God, a a favor with God that Cain did not, and that was painful for Cain. But the pain did not prompt Cain to look at his own heart and his own motives, which he could have. No, Cain decided, listen, that his problem was not him. His problem was his brother. And every time he looked at Abel, he felt bad about himself. And so at some point, this dark thought, occurs to him at first like a whisper, then like a megaphone. What if there were no Abel? 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 God tries to help Cain and speaks directly to him about this. He says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? 
If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God poses these, uh, God poses these probing self-reflection questions to Cain. Why are you angry? Why are you downcast? But notice Cain doesn't reply. Cain is silent. It's crickets. If Cain had answered God, if he confessed his envy, just confessed it to himself, to his brother, to his God, he could have been saved. But the silence of Cain was his doom. You see, envy is a silent killer. Envy destroyed his soul and eventually his brother. After Cain commits the first homicide recorded in Scripture, God said in in an unspeakably poignant and painful passage after the murder, the blood of your brother cries out to me, from the ground. John Ordberg made this observation. He said, God made the ground and God loved the ground and God made his brother Abel and God loved Abel. The good ground that God made was not made to receive the blood of one of God's children, but it has been receiving that blood for a long time now. And God says, the blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. What must it be like to be God? What must that pain be like. And so from Cain and Abel on, a green thread of envy runs all the way through the Bible. If you know much about the Bible, you will know some of these stories. Sarah, the very mother of the covenant people of God, envies Hagar and her child. Isaac, the promised son of Abraham, has an older half-brother named Ishmael. There's envy and there's rivalry that eventually breaks their family apart. Then Jacob and Esau, the next generation, is a story of envy. And so is the Jerry Springer-like story of Leah and Rachel, the wives of Jacob. And then Joseph and all of his brothers, the offspring of Jacob and his multiple wives. It's envy. And later on, we read that Miriam and Aaron were jealous of their brother Moses. And a king named Ahab covets his next-door neighbor's vineyard. And his wife, Queen Jezebel, kills the guy to get it for him. Even in the New Testament... Paul says some people preach the gospel for crying out loud out of envy and rivalry. And that still goes on today. I know a little bit about that. So one day, a man named Jesus started a community where his plan was to do the opposite of envy. Now, of course, the people who were following him, they don't know about that. They're a little slow to catch on. To the point that two of them, James and John, approached Jesus one day and said this, Jesus, grant to us one to sit at your left hand and one to sit at your right when you come into your kingdom. In the Gospel of Matthew, we're told they actually had their mother ask for them. And Jesus says, can you drink the cup I will drink? And flippantly, naively, ignorantly, they say, yep, sure thing, no problem, we got it, Lord. The other 10 disciples hear about this and they're furious, not because James and John did something wrong, but because they thought it up first. And now they're thinking, man, that's where I wanted to be. They asked first. Jesus shuts them all up. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great must become a servant. Who wants to be first must be last. Who teaches this stuff, by the way? Not Corinth, not Rome. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey guys, here's a thought. Do the opposite. Your every instinct is wrong. It's not working really well for our earth. The blood of every brother brother and sister cries out from the ground. So let's do the opposite here. Let's make our lives a joyful exercise in trying to outserve and outlove and outgive in the lives of others. You can't stop envy by trying really hard to stop trying uh, to stop envying. Spiritual Spiritual maturity is not envy management. It's not through gritted teeth, repressing, stifling feelings so that I'm miserable inside. That's the way of Cain. Envy can only be removed by love because where love is present, there's just no room for envy to take root. At the end of last year, I asked our tech team 
to give us the most watched or listened to messages from Journey from 2020. Most of the messages on that list, I did. But I noticed that Pastor Dustin Agard had two messages on that list. And at first when I saw that, there was a little twinge of something. Just a little bit. But then very quickly, I smiled inside. And I was so encouraged because I love Pastor Dustin so much. And I know the plans we have for his future at Journey. And I realize his teaching and his influence need to increase among us. You see, love leaves no room for envy to take root. It's not that we try really hard not to envy. It's that envy's uprooted by love. You can think of it like this. There are people in what might be called my circle of oneness. Could be my family, could be really close friends, folks I admire a lot, people I strongly identify with. In some ways, it's like we're one. They do well, I automatically rejoice. They hurt, I suffer with them. And then there are people in what might be called my circle of rivals. And with them, it's the opposite. If they do well, I feel diminished. If they mess up and have problems, I kind of feel a little bit better about myself. So Jesus' plan is one if we take these people over here in this circle and these people in this circle over here and just bring them into one circle. That would be called my circle of oneness. To be one family where there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Friends, it's really that simple. So this week, because love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. Don't look at other people in your lives as rivals for you to outrun or outdo. Do the opposite. Just practice with God's help looking at people in your life as people Jesus loves. A family therapist named Jim Roberts was visiting his son's fourth grade class when the teacher initiated a game called Balloon Stomp. Simple game, really. Each child had a balloon tied to their leg. The object of the game was to protect your balloon while trying to stomp on and pop everybody else's balloon. Balloon stomp is a very Darwinian game. <laughs> it's survival of the fittest with every boy and girl only out for himself or herself, except for a few timid souls who knew they could never win and opted out early by popping their own balloons first. <laughs> the, whole game over was, uh, the, the, the whole game was over quite quickly with not surprisingly the biggest, toughest, strongest, meanest kid winning. And then an unusual thing happened. Another class, one of students who are developmentally disabled, was brought in to play the same game. Balloons were tied to their legs. Instructions were read to them. And Jim Roberts said he started to get a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach because of the emotional carnage he was about to witness. But then he said the strangest thing happened. They understood the idea that the balloons were to be popped, but they just got the dog-eat-dog -dog part of it wrong. This class of developmentally disabled children went about methodically, happily, joyfully helping each other pop their own balloons. <laughs> one little girl held her balloon in place and let one little boy pop it, and then he held his balloon in place so she could have a turn. And when the last balloon was popped, the whole class cheered. It was like everybody won. You see, they did the opposite. So the question is, which game are we going to play this week? How are you going to keep score? I think what Jesus would say is keep score by asking, how many people am I able to help? Who could I encourage to shine who could I thank or compliment or recognize? Who could I brag about behind their back to others? This week, this week, just to make it really personal and concrete, pray for a competitor to shine. By the way, a competitor is anybody you compare yourself to. 
You see their success, their blessing, and it just eats away at you inside. You feel inferior or jealous. This week, identify somebody who's a competitor like that and commit to praying for them to flourish. Now, you may not feel like you want them to flourish. You know what? You can't control your feelings, but you know what you can do? You can control who you pray for. So this week, pray for your competitor to shine and ask God to replace that toxic weed of envy inside you with the flower of love. That's the plan. That's the community Jesus came to start. As we wrap up today, we're gonna prepare for communion together in a few moments, and we're gonna do that a little differently today. All of our campuses, Apopka, Lake County, and those online, we're gonna partake of communion together, and I'm gonna lead us in doing that. So I encourage you to go ahead and get your little communion kit out, and for those of you that are joining us online, whatever uh, supplies you're using to take communion with, go ahead and, and, and get those out right now. And I want us to think for just a moment before we partake about the cross and envy. Because on a human level, envy is why Jesus was put on the cross. We're told this, Pilate saw that it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to them. I mean, it's like Cain and Abel all over again. Jesus was loved, he was followed, he had charisma and power and authority and he could heal, he could teach. And religious leaders, people a lot like me, took no joy in him, but felt diminished by him. And so in their envy, they formed a plan to kill him. But it turns out Jesus had a plan to destroy envy. And Jesus decided this, I will be the object of the worst that envy can do. I will put myself in the place of Abel. It will be my very blood spilled. And when your envy is spent, I will still be loving you. I will ask God to forgive you. The very cross where you think you're defeating me is where I will be defeating envy by the power of love. You see, Jesus did what he, he did not do, what anybody else would do. He did not protect himself. He did not avenge himself. He did the opposite. And that was his whole life. God became flesh, a king laid in a manger, a savior stretched out on a cross. The whole crazy story, the whole message of the Bible in many ways is God just doing the opposite of what we would think. He was crucified and lifted up and he came into his kingdom with one condemned man on his right and one on his left and envy claimed one more victim and he died and he was buried and normally the earth keeps its dead. Normally their blood continues to cry out from the ground, but on the third day, the earth did the opposite. And the tomb was emptied and love triumphed. And now you and I are invited into that greatest circle of oneness ever, but at great cost. And we don't come to this time together puffed up. We come because we're loved up. And these elements speak of just how loved we are. And so Jesus took the bread. He said, eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you especially for Jesus and the gift of the cross. Thank you for a regular time to come to the table, to share in the bread representing Jesus' body broken for us and the cup symbolizing Jesus' blood that was shed for us to be so flooded with so much love that there's just not room for anything else. Help everybody in this room in Apopka and in Lake County and those joining us online right now 
not to rush past this moment until by some touch, some word, some thought, they know, I am loved. I am loved. I am loved. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Stand with me right now. Stand together. We love to help people take next steps in following Jesus. Because when you're following Jesus, and that's what many of us are, are seeking to do, there's always a next step to take. And perhaps you're ready to take a next step. Just go to journeychristian.com and you can see the, 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 the website there. Just let us know. I want to take a next step. Different ways that looks like for different people. Many... And we've seen every week this year so far, people take a next step of baptism. And that's a big next step. And we're ready to help you with that again today. You can just come on down, just meet us over by the baptistry area, and we'll help you with that right now. The rest of us, let's just worship together this great God of love who's poured his love out in our hearts. Let's worship together.
the church. Come on. Hey, thanks for joining us online. It's always great to worship with you. And just one reminder, no matter who you are or where you're from or what you've done, you're always welcome right here at Journey because everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect. And through Jesus, anything is possible. Hope to see you again next Sunday. <laughs>